Welcome to Immersed. Immersed is a series around music, health, wellness, and technology. Each episode, we bring together a diverse array of perspectives to explore how music and sound can improve our lives. Immersed is brought to you by Studio Feed. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Welcome to Immersed. In this episode, we'll explore the current and future potential of music and sound therapies through the use of technology and what may hinder or accelerate mass adoption of music as medicine. My name is Dave Sorbara, and I'm a new face in the Immerse series and very excited to be hosting my first episode. So to my esteemed guests, no pressure to make this a good one. <laughs> this topic, pretty near and dear to my heart, uh, it's a good kickoff to more of our exploration to how music, sound, and technology are bringing about a whole new paradigm for human potential, health, and well-being. I'll be covering more stories of artists, scientists, and entrepreneurs that are taking the latest knowledge and bringing it to life through innovative products, platforms that are legitimately changing people's lives. And today, I'm joined by three incredible and, and accomplished guests to help paint a picture of the landscape from their unique perspectives. Jennifer Buchanan is an award-winning author of TuneIn, Wellness Incorporated, and her latest book, Well Played, The Power of a Playlist. She's the founder of JB Music Therapy, employing a team of 18 certified music therapists. She's also a busy keynote speaker and executive director of the Canadian Association of Music Therapists. Aaron Labe is an inventor and entrepreneur specializing at the convergence of music, machine learning, and mental health, He's the CTO and co-founder of Lucid, a digital health company bringing innovative and scalable music therapeutics to patients worldwide. He's also an award-winning artist and a frequent speaker and guest lecturer. And last but not least, Dr. Frank Russo is a professor of psychology at Ryerson University, where he holds the NSERC Sonova Senior Research Chair in Auditory Cognitive Neuroscience. He is also an affiliate scientist at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, core member of the McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind, an adjunct professor in speech language pathology and music at the University of Toronto. Frank is also the director of Ryerson Smart Lab, an interdisciplinary research team engaged with questions at the intersection of music, mind and action. So I would love to just go around the room and hear from each of you about your work, your recent successes, and really what excites you about the future of the field you are playing in. So maybe Jennifer, if we want to start with you. Sure. Uh, th thanks for such an incredible introduction. And, and as you were saying it, I was thinking back to early in my career over 30 years ago now, and when we were just starting to collect that quantifiable data of what's happening on the front lines, because the MRI machine was making this huge entrance into our research and we're collecting so much more data. And uh, um, today what's happening is that music therapists are continuing to work the front lines. Our youngest client's two months old, our eldest is 104. We're in hospitals and corrections and schools. Um, but when it comes to the elements of technology, uh, the pandemic shut us down um, from going into a lot of um, organizations directly. So we've been incorporating things like robots to go and visit people. We have been setting up our tech gear at home to make sure that the sound is just right. We've been on a fast trajectory to find out how best can we reach the patients to help them continue to reach their goals so we don't sever the relationships that we have spent days and years establishing. So that's where we are right now. Beautiful. I love it. Um, why don't we jump over to Frank? Hi. Um, so a little bit of background around what I do day to day. Uh, I hope I haven't missed the question. I can pivot into what I've been up to during COVID times. But uh, day to day, uh, my work is multifold. Um, I do run a busy research lab where we're interested in uh, music, speech, and the mind broadly. So how is it all processed? Um, what effect does it have on our mood, affect our biology? 
How can it be used in healing? Um, you know, these are age old questions that we now have a really unique opportunity to tackle in a way that hasn't been done before. So I think it's a really exciting time to be doing this kind of work. Um, as I say, these questions are at least as old as the ancients, um, but we now have some imaging modalities and some control of sound and some statistical methods that allow us to, to take hold of these questions in a scientific way that maybe wasn't possible in the past. Uh, part of what I do is uh, I, I have a, a long history with Aaron, uh, I've been advising at Lucid for some time, and um, and over the last uh, little while, I've become their chief science officer. Um, so that's been this great opportunity to take some of the theoretical stuff that exists within music neuroscience and to to see about ways in which we could uh, we can have an impact. Uh, in the real world in building the technology that we're working on that I guess we'll unpack a little more as we go. Um, so that's been great fun. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really optimistic about what we can do in terms of scaling the impact of music by embracing technology. Um, so that's, that's a high level on who I am and what my day to day is like. Thanks, Frank. Aaron, maybe you want to continue on on Frank's tip there. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for the uh, intro, Dave. And uh, Frank, thank you for uh, introducing Lucid. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think I, as kind of a technologist uh, and an entrepreneur, have the affordance to be building something on top of the hard work and research that people like you, Frank, and you, Jennifer, um, have kind of put forth over you know decades of, of discovery. and. Um, Really, you know, I think we're at an exciting time because we're at this kind of influx where technology can really kind of enable these age old practices like you were mentioning, Frank, you know, music has always been something that has been so impactful for the brain and 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 we've known, you know, as a society, it's been such a infused part of our, our growth as a humanity. Um, you know, now we're, you know, with machine learning and all these amazing technologies, we have this ability to kind of unlock some some hidden potential. Um, which I think is really exciting. Um, Jennifer, even kind of like what you were saying with the robots, I think that's amazing. Uh, I'd love to experience your musical robots. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think we as, you know, technologists and, and, and you know, researchers and, and all these other amazing people uh, have this ability to do something really scalable and bring the beauty of music therapeutics to people all around the world. Uh, so that's super exciting. Um, also great to meet you, Jennifer. Um, obviously, Frank and I know each other, so I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of put that out there. But anyway, that's kind of my my intro, I guess. Uh, thanks again, Dave, for the, the great intro as well. Thanks, Aaron. I want to ask a big, broad question, and someone can put their hand up to start this one off. But, you know, I think we all understand the value of music to humanity. I really wanted to ask, how does music therapy work, or why does it work? I know it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big question, but just the, the way to frame where this conversation might head. Does someone want to throw a hand up or should I? <laughs> sure, I can go. I go can for go. It. Go for it, um, You know, the, it's such a great question. Uh, in as, as music therapists going into the facilities and establishing relationships with our clients, so we're very frontline. Um, meaning that we're sitting at the bedside or we're in a classroom, um, we're in a group program, we have sometimes six people around us, we have sometimes one-on-one -on -one where we are. And why this works is, and I think we're all going to be able to talk about the different layers, um, it is certainly because music's capacity to so efficiently and effectively affect us in our mood and our memory and our motivations. It is so quick that as we are working with, in our case, working with patients and clients who 
are sometimes going through the most difficult times of their life. They have been blindsided by being in a car accident or they've had a stroke or um, it's a family that's in crisis or you've had a, a mental health condition that has come at you over time and you're really wanting to look after it this time. And those are the people we're seeing. And so with what can happen in a music therapy session for us is that we can establish a relationship with the individual very quickly and then using very specific techniques based on the the person's goals whatever those are going to be we go through a session and a series of sessions that we have seen the results replicated over time with other individuals. And so we're bringing in that evidence clinically, as well as the research that has been collected over the last you know, few decades um, into that session in order to help the person move forward. So um, it's, it's this incredible way that there's that music affects the brain in more areas of the brain simultaneously than any other activity I know of. And maybe my esteemed um, friends, colleagues today can tell me otherwise, but I do believe that has a lot to do with why it's so efficient and effective so fast, um, the change that and results can be seen. Oh, you're on mute, David. <laughs> oh, sorry. Efficiency. Efficiency, yes. That's, I think, the speed at which music can work. And I noticed Frank's head nodding when you talked about that. Maybe he can jump in there. And one thing I want to do is follow this up is with your, your note about being on the ground with people forging relationships. And to follow up, you know, maybe Frank talking about the brain and the efficiency of music, we can talk about whether that relationship is required to really deliver music therapy or can technology allow it to scale really efficiently for thousands and thousands of people? But I'll, I'll let Frank jump in. Okay. Um, and, and I will say that my experience in music therapy is next to nil because I, you know, not a music therapist. I will say, I'll share with Jennifer that uh, as I was transitioning in from from fledgling musician into some kind of scientist. Uh, I, I did try to run some music therapy groups at a, at a few, in a few places. And uh, it all sound, it all seemed like this is really powerful stuff, but it's beyond me. Maybe I wanna uh, understand this in a different way. Um, so yeah, I was nodding, I think when Jennifer was talking about this rapid ability for synchronization, uh, because that is one of the real powers that music has. Um, we're, you know, we're social beings and we're all hardwired to synchronize with one another. And one of the means by which we do this is through um, regularities in movement, in speech and in music. And in a way, you know, some people have characterized music as a kind of hack uh, and it's a hack in many ways, but one way in which it kind of hacks the brain and our, and our um, ability for social connection is that it regularizes the movement. Like we are not just going to move together in a conversation. It's not just going to be you nod after I talk and you take a turn after I turn. Now we're going to make this super regular. We're going to lock ourselves into a common framework and we are going to be creating the same sound. We are going to be uh, finishing each other's thoughts. And um, there's some really elegant hardware in the brain that allows us to do this. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll just digress for a moment. I think the reason it's there may have something to do with, um, with our reliance on um, speech for communication so um or at least vocalizations for communication uh if i'm if i'm a fledgling infant and i'm trying to figure out how to operate in this world then i am going to try to mimic the things that i hear around me and that's going to require me to hear what you say and and push it back um and um 
that requires this nice connectivity between the auditory centers and the motor centers. Um, um, and, you know, it's no accident, I don't think, that, that parents speak to their infants in this kind of sing-songy way in order to enculturate them and to get them to learn the vocabulary and the, the structures and the rules of communication. So music affords this elegant ability to synchronize with one another. And I can think of really very few other things that, that afford the same level of synchrony. There is dance and dance and music, I, I, you know, I think they've co-evolved. Um, there is chanting, if you look cross-culturally, historically. Um, but me, you might be thinking, oh, there's things like yoga, you know, that, or, uh, or uh, music and fitness classes where people are all moving together. Those come close. But when you're making music with someone else, or you're in a large group of people making music, you really are hearing the entire group uh, in the moment when you are uh, producing what it is that you're producing. You don't have to step outside the music in order to feel that I'm part of this larger whole. And so you have this deep kind of connection with the people you're making music with. And that could just be your mom, if you're an infant <laughs> singing. It could be you and a music therapist. It could be a group of people singing together in a community choir. But all of a sudden, you lose the limits of who, who you are, and you become this kind of superhuman, uh, sorry, super organism that transcends boundaries. Uh, although that's sounding really, uh, you know, that we could go on profound tan tangents. I don't even think that cap captures uh, even 10% of what mu music's capable of. Uh, awesome. But that's an important piece, this power to connect people together. I'd even say, to add on to that, Frank, uh, the I, you can kind of, you get that out of recorded music too. You know what I mean? Even by just simply listening to a recording passively, and this is kind of, you know, going into my response a bit, Dave, but you know, coming from, you know, personal experience with, with like, you know, living through the mental health system and, and being a patient, you know, you, the mental health in particular is such an isolating experience. The, you know, connection that you feel through music, whether it be recorded or played in, in person or participatory, is just so profound and such a nurturing experience that, you know, music alone has that, has, has just this kind of unique ability to, to bring that out. You know, when you're isolated, you feel like you're a part of something. Um, again, just even putting a, a pair of headphones on and, and listening, which is kind of where, you know, Lucid exists, which is purely through this kind of digital uh, digital realm. It's just such a powerful tool for that for that reason. You know, whereas like you know, the standard of care is pills and all these other, um, you know, vehicles. Music is one of the few things that feels participatory outside of you know going to your therapist once a week or something. So I think that's one of the unique characteristics that music can offer um, people in their healing process. Thanks for that, Aaron. It, 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 yeah, I wanted to follow that up and I'm glad you made that mention is Frank's talking about this inclusivity of, of the group and wondering whether that can translate on one-on-one -on -one just through the process of listening to recorded music. And it's clear it's, you're part of something when you're listening, you are part of that whole. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's why, uh, again, I don't, I don't want to throw any hatred or, or negativity towards generative music, but that's why one of the reasons, you know, Lucid is really keen on, on musicians recording um, in kind of the old fashioned way is that sense of commun uh, connection uh, mm -hmm. with another human. I think people can feel that, right? And I think it's difficult mm -hmm. to get that through. But I, I swear I feel great connection to to 808 beats. Uh, oh yeah. All, all the same. So it's a mystery, it's a mystery. <laughs> it is a mystery. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost kind of like the Coke challenge, right? You know, you tell somebody, oh, this is made by a person and they're like, okay, you know, then you know, these days it's getting harder to tell. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe we can start talking. I've always had this question, and, and it might be political, might be cultural, why music and sound therapies aren't just widespread and easily accessible. Meaning, if I go see my doctor and I'm complaining about anxiety, got high cortisol, why... 99 times out of 100, do they not suggest <laughs> some sort of music therapy or go home and 
turn on your favorite album and listen for an hour. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're starting to get that practice happening, you know, even in my family with my kids, but it's just not a standard of care, which is just dumbfounding to me. I don't know if any of you want to jump in with an answer to that. And maybe it's just where we are in terms of our evolution or the evolution of medicine. Jennifer, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting because you're right. I think we're just on the cusp of those social prescriptions where people are going to um, start from the from the family doctors being able to ensure that your quality of life um, is just as important as our quantity of life. And we're getting there. Um, we're certainly seeing, it, although it's end of life care called palliative care, um, we're seeing a lot of evolution there around that quality of life piece around um, what is going to just make your next day brighter or better or more strengthened than this current day. And music is definitely um, one of the more accessible ways that I feel people can do that. Um so it's interesting you're saying that, but why isn't, you know, um, so from my sector, a music therapist in absolutely every long term care site across, you know, our countries in North America, our states and provinces? I don't know. I don't know why that is, but I do know that it's more than it used to be. I was at number 133 of music therapists in Canada and today we have over a thousand so it's definitely growing um and I also just by looking at social media you can see that people are recognizing the potential for what music can do what art can do when it comes to healing and health and wellness practices and uh, I can't help but feel hopeful that we are on the cusp of that next step where it is going to be recognized um, and recommended from the, the frontline physician that's going to say, listen, how about if we do a little bit more of this in addition to our nutrition and exercise, right? It's going to be Great a part answer, of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. I might jump in. I I don't know if you're going to pivot or uh, uh, go go for it. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, (laughs) uh, I'll just say that um, that there are some jurisdictions in the world where where apparently uh, GPs are uh, starting to think about music as an alternative. So one big one is in the UK. So they've Mm -hmm. got this social prescription model that's evolving. Um, And the idea is that a good percentage of visits to your medical doctor really can can be traced back to just depression, loneliness, lack of social connection. And some of those could be dealt with more effectively uh, by engaging in your community. And one of the main modalities for that is music. It's not the only one, but it's an important one. Mm-hmm. It's always good news. And speaking of um, more of the world accessing music therapy, maybe Aaron, you just want to talk about how Lucid's tackling music personalization because we know there's not a one size fits all. This song will help people go to sleep, <laughs> and, of all, and this will help everyone go to sleep. It's really a it's a personal process as part of the whole. I just want to talk about how Luce is tackling that problem of scale through technology, because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the landscape of music therapeutics is huge, right? And I think, you know, um, there's so much space for so many different solutions. Um, one of the things that Lucid is trying to focus on is really this idea of, of scale, like you're saying, Dave, or this idea of access for people who might not have the ability to get access to kind of in-person music therapy or, or any of these other solutions. Um, kind of thinking back to myself when, when you know, when I was dealing with uh, mental health challenges, uh, not being in spaces where those things were, were present. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is really prescribe uh, or, or, or provide music uh, through a purely digital experience that personalizes, right? And I think that's a, a key part of therapeutic music experiences is there's no idea, there's no such thing as kind of like wellness music across the board that is, you know, the one pill, right? And I think that's 
the one thing music therapists do super well is they they curate the experience to the person in that moment and that's one of the most beautiful things that i i love about about that practice so what we try to do um with our approach is we basically have an ai that that you know learns what music to play at certain in certain parts of the day or certain parts of the patient's kind of mental state um, in order for them to get their desired outcome so kind of one of our core focuses up until now has been anxiety so our algorithms learn what music to play in order to de-escalate anxiety given the context um, so you know if if i am feeling stressed um, and you know other contextual cues might be present, this particular song or these particular musical features might need to be present for me in order to de-escalate. De Whereas tomorrow, I might feel a different way um, and I might need different musical features. And that's one thing that our algorithms try to do is basically figure out that balance for each person um, individually in the network. Uh, and I think that's a really key thing when it comes to providing music uh, at a therapeutic level is really that personalization piece. Mm -hmm. um, and, and music therapists have kind of, I, I think, have nailed that. You know, they, they, they're, they're there in person and creating it, you know, We try. Time. We try yeah, to yeah. nail that. I, you know, the first yeah. time I witnessed a music therapy session, I was so amazed by that, like, almost like improvisation practice. I'm like, it's like, wow, these people are really good musicians, too. It's like you can play pretty much any style and, and really customize it. So the whole vision around Lucid was like, can we do this digitally mm -hmm. in, in any capacity, even just scratch the surface, even if it's not nearly as perfect, but at least something. Um, totally. That's kind of that's kind of the idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say, because so it's a good segue into the idea of a feedback loop, because music, ther music therapists are there in the moment as a human feedback loop. They're, they're gauging body language and reaction. And I guess my question is, that'll never go away. And that's going to be a very powerful process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know, you know, Frank, Aaron, you guys are working with a lot of biometric inputs. Can this evolution of biometrics and mm -hmm. sophisticated biometrics are getting cheaper and cheaper? Does that will that provide a robust enough tool set to almost like to become an analog for being in the room with someone? I mean, it's it's kind of like that that age old AI fear question Mike's of like, like no. uh, yeah, Mike's like no. I'm, I'm 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 gonna get there, Frank, but in a, yeah. in a, a bit more of an elegant uh, answer, yeah. I think. But yeah, I think uh, not to say that that wasn't elegant, um, but I think um, yeah, it's kind of that age-old question of like, are the machines gonna replace us, right? And and I, mm. you know, even as an AI, you know, engineer, I I don't think that's that's the case. Even that's why you know, even with generative music, it's kind of laughable in some senses. Of like, oh, well, this will replace musicians. It's like, ah, really? Um, but I, I, but I, you know, it's interesting you're saying that though, because it, where I compare this to is so I go to my physiotherapist to fix my ankle, but they give me exercises in between, and I have to watch the oh. videos now, right. and yeah. I know I'm not doing it perfect. But yeah. it is making a difference to the next step of me to continue my improvement. That's a great and analogy. that's where I see something like this really critical, right? Yeah. And that's exactly yeah. kind of what I was getting at is like we can we can fill the gaps in to make people better versions mm -hmm. of themselves way more than we could have previously. And that's kind it's of so where good. I see where I see AI is it's it's filling in those gaps where where humans can't can't get to you, right? And I think mm -hmm. you see a lot of great analogs in the teletherapy space too, where you know, therapists, you know, are, you know, constantly have been in over demand, whereas now there, you know, there's all these bots and things where you can, you can chat with when you're not seeing your therapist. And now we're even doing zoom calls and, you know what I mean? There, there's ways that technology can, can fill in the gaps and, and make people whole while we still have those, those opportunities uh, for human interaction, which, you know, are, are, are very irreplaceable. One of my favorite uh, ML teachers, uh, machine learning teachers in school said, well, you mean the most sophisticated neural network is in between your ears. Uh, which is basically like, you know, the, the human brain is just so complex. It's like we're never going to replace that. But it, the things that we can do to make humans better with AI, it's it's huge for sure. Frank, do you want to um, just talk about how when I mentioned biometrics, like impossible? <laughs> yeah, I really liked Aaron's answer uh, and I'm kind of caught up in it. But but I, I guess I, I was just, um, you, you know, I think that we can get a good read on people's mood states, which are important inputs to what a music therapist would do, I think. And um, and we could read body language and timing and what works and what doesn't work. But then there's this really challenging problem of how do you update the music in real time? Uh, there is a solution with generative music that 
you know, Aaron's mentioned a few times, and that's this idea of not working from something that's uh, composed and performed, but rather uh, taking some data stream or streams of input and generating sound output. Uh, that is a way to respond dynamically, but it doesn't have uh, it, it doesn't have the fingerprints of the human on it. And so I don't think the opportunity for those deep connections are there. So something in between, you know, where you read the biometrics, you read how people are doing, and you you queue up music that's going to suit that mood, uh, uh, or maybe the objectives of the listener. That's obviously what Luce is working on, and I, I think it's a it's a good road. Uh, and I really like what Jennifer had to say about the supplementary role that these technologies can have. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to replace the human, um, but there's only so so many therapists um, <laughs> available. And you know, there's a there's a cost issue. There's a location issue. There are people that live in remote communities. Um, uh, there's many gaps to fill. Yeah. Just like any good tech, it can be the extension of, of our human. Totally. Work, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, you need a lot of different pieces for a very complex human. You know, mm -hmm. we need lots of that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to ask, Jennifer, you, you talked about it in terms of your practice and how it changed it through, through COVID. I was going to ask you how mm -hmm. music therapy in a traditional sense, has evolved with technology. Mm. And you've talked about it. And maybe you want to talk a little more about whether those things that are happening through COVID, the robots, just different ways. Yeah. Of, are those things going to stick around and yeah. see new opportunities? Or is it one of those things like, this is all we got to do now, and then we're just going to shut it down and go back to the way we were, were doing it before? You know, it's interesting you're asking that because... Um, so first of all, just in regards to online sessions, you know, um, I wasn't sure if that was going to be a strong trend afterwards. But what we are finding is that some people are having greater success in their music therapy session virtually. And there is psychological safety for some to have a screen in between me and them or us and them um, where they will share more and communicate more. Um, and that's been really important. In the other way, we have found also there have been some situations where it has not worked at all um, and that that human connection is what is making the difference. So so we've been seeing both of those things. Um, what the robots have provided us is access. So we have been working um, consistently in ICUs and burn units through the pandemic. That would not have been possible without us using a robot. So um, we've been using a couple of different ones. One's from Omni Labs and one is from Double Robotics. And essentially what they are is that um, the sound is great. Um, we can wheel right up so we can manually wheel from our home office and go up to a bedside. We can make ourselves a little shorter so we can be face to face and we can provide a session there without being there. And then we go to the nursing desk afterwards and saying, can you wipe our face so we can go to the next one? So it's quite this is something <laughs> that yeah. is happening. Um, but what a gift that we have been able to provide service at using that. Um, in other places, you know, we use technology like we use with Youth at Risk and you'll you'll create um, not only live music, but we'll also create songs on GarageBand, you know, so there's a, a lot of different ways that we will incorporate technology over the years and change um, and have tried to keep up and, and change with it. Um, and, I, and I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what's next, what what's going to be coming down the pipe, but I'm really loving this concept of using music therapeutics in between our sessions and actually prescribing, okay, here's your homework and here's something you can do. And I look forward to seeing you next Thursday. So that's great. Awesome. 
Uh, Frank, I was going to ask you on the, on the heels of the idea of the evolution of traditional music therapy, in terms of your research and your work on the brain and neuroscience, is there anything that's happening, that's happened very recently, learning studies that are changing how you see the idea of music in the brain, like the latest, greatest? Uh, well, one thing that's sort of resonating for me at the moment, I can't say it's the latest or greatest, but it's, <laughs> it's salient. There's a, there's a, it's salient in my thinking right now. Uh, it, it's this idea of um, music that is, uh, that is familiar to us, that we enjoy, uh, you know, that could be self-selected music, music that's that's in my collection or um, uh, music that an AI serves up that resembles things that I've enjoyed in the past. Uh, there's more and more evidence that that kind of music uh, engages the reward system of the brain. So, you know, this, this ancient reward pathway that keeps us uh, surviving as humans, uh, finding food, finding partners to procreate, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, that reward system seems to be more engaged and we see more auditory uh, reward connectivity when people are listening to, um, to music that they enjoy. So one really cool study, for example, looked at, used neuroimaging to look at activation in uh, the reward system. And they found that um, auditory reward connectivity predicted the amount of money that people would spend on that track uh, when that was assessed after the experiment. So it's kind of like the ultimate consumer experiment that you might po pose to a neuroscientist you know can can we predict how much people will pay for this track well turns out you can uh and it has something to do with the extent to which uh it's it's engaging these reward networks so what does that mean for what we're all doing like music therapists and uh, ai curated music therapy i think it means that um you know we we, we do have to be sensitive to what the client brings to the table like you know what works for them because that's gonna going to ultimately be more effective that's really interesting and and it's a good segue for me because we're um nearing the end of this conversation i think we could talk for hours but i wanted to bring in um kind of the juggernaut music businesses meaning the big dsps into this conversation spotify apple music amazon mm -hmm. and <laughs> Just exactly what you're talking about there, Frank. Are, you know, the big players like a Spotify, are they helping people find joy through music or are they just really a marketing machine for music brands? And I know it's a, you know, it's a, again, another broad question. Um, I don't know who wants to jump in on this answer, but are they helping individuals get to a more joyful place or are they just serving up, you know, what, next artist brand needs to be served up in order to distribute money in the right way. I don't know if anyone has the answer to that or, or can elaborate, but everyone's looking up like. <laughs> I feel um, like Aaron's got a good answer to this yeah. question. I, mean, I, I mean, might yeah, fumble I, around, but yeah. I have, I have opinions for sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, the question of does it bring joy is complex. I think that's probably why all of us look to the ceiling. When you when you said it that way, because you know consumers enjoy a lot of the things that are served up to them, right? And I think because those those machines are designed to serve up that kind of dopamine release and that feeling of like oh like this this machine knows me or this AI knows me. And Spotify, I mean, I I I've personally you know been surprised by the things that it has served me in terms of music to my preferences. I think the challenge with these platforms, it, you know, from even a, an AI and technological standpoint is all they're optimizing for is, you know, is, is for somebody to, to listen to it for as long as possible and, and to kind of keep them on the platform. It's kind of like, you know, casinos are, are designed for people to stay inside of the casino. You know what I mean? Like there's there are so many different mechanisms at play that want to keep you there as long as possible. Whereas, you know, a platform where you're trying to achieve an outcome or something 
specifically for the patient, it's kind of the opposite, right? Like, uh, you know, not to again too lucid, but even other therapeutic music platforms or, or other competitors of ours, you know, they want you to be there almost as little as possible. They want you to like get to your goal and then feel that goal and then and then kind of that's it. Right. You know, it's just like a, a talk therapy session or a music therapy session. It, you know, once you achieve your goal, it's like, okay, great, this is awesome. But it's not kind of the 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 optimization of the machine or the AI um, on these big DSPs. It's it's just a different outcome. They're they're trying to keep people there as long as possible. Whereas, you know, these these healing and wellness tools are 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 really trying to get you to where you want to be and then get you there quickly. Right. I think that's, that's, a, that's it's a great answer. I, I guess a simpler question I could have asked is does the chill out playlist on Spotify work <laughs> therapist? And right. I guess sort of, um, but in actuality, it's there to, I mean, like a, 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 a downside, uh, kind of a, I don't know, a disappointing thing that I learned is a lot of these uh, functional playlists are owned by the big record labels. Um, and they're designed to get spins for artists that aren't kind of their main catalog right and and i've even you know and, and those are things that I've, I've talked to label reps about and it's it's a way for them to jump on the wellness music craze um <laughs> while you know getting additional you know plays on spotify uh for instance mm -hmm. so you know rarely will you see a billy eilish on one of those playlists playlists you'll see these you know smaller artists um you know, and, and these labels kind of design those playlists accordingly, right? I mean, obviously Spotify mm -hmm. has curators as well, but a lot of the big wellness playlists aren't the Spotify playlists. They're like Digster and all these other brands that are owned by the big labels. So yeah. there's an element of marketing around wellness music as well. Um, <laughs> totally. And I think uh, uh, it's kind of a, you know, not a crutch, by the way, it's just like, oh, well, you know, you didn't really hit the charts, but maybe in the wellness category, you'll be able to make some money. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, I don't know. So it depends. It's kind of the outcome, right? It's the goal again. Um, yeah. And, you know, David, I spent the entire um, last last year and a half, you know, putting together a book in just around this because um, I am going to tell you, yes, I listened to those chill playlists that you've just talked about for sure. Um and they do do something, you know, going back to what we said before, it's we need we need it all in some way, you know, access to it all in some way. But I feel what my job is, what my purpose is, is not to have music just hit somebody, but for them to take control, take be sit in the driver's seat and actually drive what playlist is going to be best for them in that moment. And, and, uh, you know, so that was entirely why I wrote Wellness Well Played was here is a variety of different ways we can use playlists. Um, what do these actual playlists do? And it's about connecting people to their music, either music they already know or music that they're now going to explore and stay in a growth mindset in regards to that. So, um but it is interesting. And Aaron, I loved how you basically just said, you know, that, um, you know, we've profited on music wellness and and curating these playlists and and there are people really appreciate them. Now I want to get people to work a little harder and create their own playlists and they can use those platforms. But I want them to delve a little bit deeper because that is where the healing potential of what music can do for our wellness is, is in that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I think, yeah, it's it's really around setting a different intention when it comes to music. Mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the education, which I'm seeing happening. And I, I guess maybe to finish, I was going to ask this question. Are you guys confident that music can put a real serious dent in the mental health crisis we're facing today. I believe it it's already started and people are moving towards it rapidly and more so than ever before. So just wanted to hear if we can tackle it with music. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say that there's, there's, uh, there's lots of good evidence uh, that's accumulating that uh, music can help with a number of indications. You know, we've talked about anxiety and, and depression, these mood disorders. Um, there's also support for its its involvement in 
a range of communication disorders, uh, so from Parkinson's disease to aphasia in supporting rehabilitation. That's some of the work that music therapists do. Uh, there's real great promise for dementia care. You know, we all, I think, have firsthand experience uh, seeing what it can do with our, with our, uh, with our loved ones that are experiencing some cognitive impairment. And I think we're just scratching the surface at really understanding the potential, using the scientific method, using technology to scale it, and really harness the power of music. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think, I think it's only a matter of time. And I think, you know, like you said, Dave, we're already starting to scratch the surface. But, you know, as somebody who was a patient at one period of time, hacking together a music therapy practice for myself, you know, if that worked, then surely, you know, with technology and, and people like Jennifer and, and, you know, all of these other movements that, you know, that's, that's got to that, that, you know, that's got to make a huge dent. And I think, you know, I don't even think we need to stop at mental health either. I think like Frank's saying, there's so many other health conditions mm -hmm. that we're just mm -hmm. completely ignoring music's potential for um, in terms mm -hmm. of like a status quo level. So yeah, I, I'm confident and uh, I'm excited to see it happen. And oh, we're just scratching I, the surface of the, of the <laughs> potential. I love that. Totally. And I'm completely biased. I, uh, I think it's the answer. I think the right music in the right way at the right time, um, yeah, it's going to, you know, decrease pain and improve mental health. And um, it's going to strengthen uh, any possible health goal that you have. I, I just, I sit firmly in that, but I am biased. <laughs> yeah, I think we all are, but, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> We're, you know, yeah. there's a room of smart people here still, so bias or not, <laughs> I, I think that's a uh, well said for sure. I mean, another optimistic note is is that the gatekeepers are starting to listen. So this kind mm -hmm. of work is is getting picked up by the in, in, you know the more important uh, scientific journals. Uh, I think medical mm -hmm. practitioners are more aware of what music therapy can do. It's making its mm -hmm. way into the popular media. Uh, so, uh, uh, the best is coming. Yeah, that's great. Well, why don't we wrap it up there? That's a great way to finish. And, uh, I just want to thank Frank, Jennifer, and Aaron for joining me in this conversation. And, uh, thank you for all your insights. And I hope, um, the audience gleaned a lot of information. We'll try to provide a lot of stuff in, in the show notes. Uh, so thank you to the audience for joining and tuning in. And thank you uh, to Immersed for allowing me to host my first one. <laughs> Hope there'll be many more. And follow us. You can follow us on socials. Visit us at projectimmersed.org. And until next time, we will see you all soon.